There's a light in the sky Rising in the air There's a feeling so strong It's time to light the fire Like a bright shining Hello and welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy. You're very grateful to be here with uh, Joe Stanley, <laughs> Rachel Finch and Luke Hines. Hello, team. How are you? Hello. G'day, Darcy. Huge G'day, guys. Happy Got to be here. Good energy in the House of Wellness, uh, can I say, right off the top. But, hey, I love winter. Winter's my favourite uh, season of the year. I love a bit of that winter sunshine you get. But also, you get into the rhythm of sport in Melbourne. It's the sporting capital of the world, Joe. Well, it's true, but all around the world, sport is wonderful. Matilda's captain, Sam Kerr, is leading the team in the FIFA World Cup over in France. I love that team so much. No matter what happens, no matter the result, they bring mm. incredible skill and such positivity that they're beautiful to watch. And I think they do Aussies proud, wherever and they go. It's a really exciting time of the year. We've got the Cricket World Cup kicking off in England at the moment. We've got Wimbledon. I was going to say kicking off, but hitting off yes. with our very own. I can't wait for Ash Barty in Wimbledon. I hope she just takes oh. it from strength to strength. It's that champion. amazing yeah. French Open it's win. It's just such a good time of year, especially in the colder months here. I love checking out the skiing and the snowboarding with the aerial stuff that they do. The things that they can flip around, it's Unbelievable. Well, speaking of aerials, I got to work on the Winter Olympic coverage in Pyeongchang last year in South Korea with Channel 7. And I, can I tell you, being at the bottom of those jumps oh. and oh. those runs, watching <laughs> the speed and the height they get in person, it just brings a whole new appreciation to the, the sport. It's the phenomenal. Courage to do that. Yeah. Uh, off the, how about you, Rach? As a kid, winter sport, what was your go to? I'm touch footy. I'm, I've always played touch footy or athletics, and they were my go to's at school. So. That's it, grass dive. Wouldn't want to be hip and shouldered by the old Rachie Finch. No. <laughs> you know what? I have been and I felt it. Yeah, that's when we did it. We did our self defense stuff. Oh, Sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> Not just backstage, on there too. One of my favourite moments so far on the House of Wellness. And today we're focusing on Aussie sporting champions. Not so much to celebrate their incredible achievements on the field, but a way to look at the crucial area of men's mental health. And Heinze, probably something as guys were coming to terms with the ability to talk more openly. Yeah, definitely. I think we're getting there and with initiatives such as Are You OK Day, we're starting to have more of a conversation on social media as well. But I think there's more that can be done. Considering that suicide is still the leading cause in young men, mm. it is phenomenal and we need to do so much more. Yeah, very important topic. Looking forward to having Gus Wall and the man yeah. behind Gotcha for Life, uh, the campaign, with us back in studio uh, today, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's so much focus on physical health these days, Dust, that it's really important to remember that, of course, mental health has a huge impact on our our bodies but if it is an injury that requires treatment how do you choose your specialist so this week as the final part of our back to basics series we're checking out the physio hi Denise hi Jack come on through thank you I'm a musculoskeletal physio, so I treat people with uh, spinal problems, upper back, lower back, as well as uh, arm and leg problems. Yeah, How have you been you. since I saw you a couple of weeks ago? Physiotherapist Joanne Rate has found her niche in a diverse field designed to get bodies moving. So there's a huge range of areas that physios can go in. You do your basic training four years and then might develop a special interest in an area and do extra qualifications in that area, depending on your areas of passion. Now what I want you to do is go onto your hands and knees. At the core of a physio's treatment is a focus on exercise and movement to relieve symptoms. Again, we want your spine in that neutral position. In the past with back problems, people were advised to rest in bed, but graduated return to activities is the big focus and all the evidence is behind, behind that area. Now, Denise, can I get you to do that again, just on your left leg? Gym junkie Denise Tamaris turned up to physiotherapy after one too many sit-ups brought on severe lower back pain. It's affected how you get up in the morning, how you get out of bed affected me in the way that I can't go to gym as much as I would like to. Any symptoms? No. I have to modify what I do so I don't bend as much as I used to. 
Tilt your pelvis, flattening your back into my hands. After I've taken a history of a patient, we'll get them on the bed doing active movements, checking their muscle control. So you're keeping your core switched on while you're adding in some leg movement. We'll assess their core muscles, see if they can get their spine in what we call a neutral position. Bending the knee and lowering the foot to the ground. Often we need to use manual techniques to reduce stiffness in the spine, but other patients might be too mobile, so that might be more just working on the core stability or the taping or braces, etc. So today we're going to practice on finding that neutral spine position. In managing everything from sports injuries to chronic health conditions, Joanne tailors the treatments to fit. If it's not hard enough, we can give you a different colour rubber band to use at home. Physios might use spiky balls or tennis balls or foam rollers so that patients can do their own therapy at home. A lot of my patients go to the gym, so educating them in use of gym equipment. We like to try and create the ability for patients to be able to self-manage their conditions. I can feel a little bit of stiffness. Physios are well trained. We're well respected by the medical profession. We are trained in the hospital environment. We have extensive assessment skills and with a patient managing their symptoms and their condition and getting them back to their pre-injury level and feeling that they can self-manage and prevent the problem coming on in the future. Now, Joe, I know that uh, you've had some experience with uh, physios before. What do you think? Yeah, that's one of the things I really love about physio is that they use exercise to treat whatever's going on with you. I'm not an athlete. I've mentioned that before. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a housewife runner. I love shuffling along the beach for about 8Ks here and there. But, but I, you know, you get injuries. And I've always found that they use exercise in the gym to help you recover from that injury, which I've loved about physio. Now, after the break, uh, let's meet the stars of our three-part series. That's coming up next on The House of Wellness. Welcome back. You're watching The House of Wellness. For the past three weeks, we've been investigating differences between a chiropractor, a physiotherapist and an osteopath. Uh, Joe, not an easy thing to do. So to wrap it all up, we brought in all three to join us on the couch. Welcome physio Joanne Wright, Michelle Funder, the osteo and the chiropractor Michael Bloom. Thanks for joining us, guys. Thanks for having us. Now, uh, let me start. I want to ask a bit of an insight in a nutshell. Can you give me a quick one-liner of what the differences are? I might start with you, Michelle. What sets osteos apart? Uh, osteopaths are generally, we look at the body in a more holistic fashion. So when you come in to see an osteopath and you have something like low back pain, we'll be looking at not only the lower back, the hips, the knees, the ankles. We'll be treating other areas of the body, not just the area of the symptom, to make sure that we're uh, really getting down to the root of the cause with osteopathy. OK, Joe, physio can step in now. What uh, sets you apart? Physios are trained in hospitals, so we have quite a medical focus to our assessment and management of patients, especially uh, lower back pain patients in this case, and we try to use evidence-based medicine, uh, research-informed choices in our decision-making in how to best manage patients. Now, and do we have to be careful here because historically mm -hmm. the chiros and the physios were at war with each other. Uh, Michael <laughs> uh, didn't put the two in one room together. Uh, is that an urban myth or what sets the chiros apart? Oh, I'm glad you put me on a separate seat. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, look, I think it's a bit of an urban myth. There'll be a small percentage within each profession that, uh, you know, have an axe to grind about the other professions. But I think in general we... I think it's beat up a little bit that and we tend to get along better than maybe the public uh, public may have been led to believe. Oh, I think we, we get along fine. So what about the chiros? What sets you apart from the physio and the osteo disciplines? Well, chiropractic has traditionally always been about the relationship between structure and function and by that particularly the structure of the spine and then therefore its effect on the function of the whole body. Mm -hmm. That's from the inception of chiropractic. But... Um, I guess in a similar vein to the physiotherapy and the uh, osteopathy, we're, you know, we're evidence-based and we have progressed with the times and we, we, look at, um, we look at factors which lead to people you know, going down that road of perhaps their health's not as great as it should be and, mm -hmm. and bringing our skill set into helping them recover. I, when I uh, think about oste uh, sorry, Cairo, I know you as people that crack backs. Is that the difference, that you spend more time on the spine rather than the rest of the body? 
Uh, we do. We we are known for that. Mm. Absolutely. We do spend uh, we do spend time in our education, and we do spend time in our practice dealing with the other joints of the body. Uh, traditionally, that. Uh, cracking style that you just described is what we've been known for. However, look, there's a lot of diversity even within yeah. our profession. There are chiropractors that uh, they would do no, none of that cracking type adjustment and then there are many others that will. But traditionally, we've always been known for that high speed, low force thrust into the spine. Mm. Hey, Michelle, uh, in your profile last piece last uh, week, which was fantastic, by the way, you mentioned that you assess uh, the whole body more than just the area causing the pain. What, what other factors are you looking at? Um, we're looking at the whole body, so uh, biopsychosocial models. So when we take a history, we're talking to people about, you know, how much they sleep, their stress levels, what they're eating, so that we get a, a real idea of what their whole body is, you know, going through and how that relates to their physical uh, injury. So, you know, you might be coming in for head, neck and shoulder pain, but they may be a very stressed person. There might be lots of other things going on. So really stepping back and looking at the whole body and then not only just treating the head, neck and shoulders, but uh, the diaphragm, which is a big muscular dome under the rib cage, has a lot of uh, links to the neck nervous system, to stress, um, and so we'd be treating those areas. So sometimes clients sort of think, oh, I'm in here for my neck and shoulders, but I'm getting my ribs, you know, treated. So uh, it's, it's a really lovely way of looking at the whole person and not just the area of symptoms. So, Joe, for a physio, is there a type of patient or a certain condition you say, hey, this is the sweet spot for physio, stay away from uh, Michelle, stay away from Michael, uh, you can only come and see me for one particular type of ailment? I wouldn't say that. I think we probably all have a place in managing similar conditions, but I think the fact that as a physio we can work on field with our sporting teams, we can see patients with back pain in an ED situation, we can see them with, in conjunction with doctors in, in hospitals trying to determine if they need surgery or see them uh, possibly in rehabilitation hospitals doing exercise therapy afterwards. So I feel that physios just can see them throughout the whole journey of the back pain cycle. Now, I must confess that I do see an osteo and I see a physio and I have seen a chiro <laughs> in the past. Is it OK, do you think, Michael, for me to see two or three different disciplines at once? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That commonly happens. Mm. There are people that are seeing me that are seeing an osteopath in the same week. In fact, it's happening this week. There are people <laughs> that see me that see a physio, so I have absolutely no issue. We can't all be um, fantastic at everything. We have our skill sets, so we need to uh, we need to help someone manage uh, themselves to get the best outcome for themselves, and that may be a se seeing a mixture of people. This is like reality mm. TV now, Joe. You've got to I choose know. a practitioner. Where are you going? Oh, look! All I know is when you talk about time on the table, I just imagine the noises that come from me when I am <laughs> being manipulated and treated. I mean, you're all very talented people, but geez, sometimes you go, "Is this supposed to feel good?" <laughs> I don't know. But you feel, you come away feeling great. Thanks to everyone again for taking part in our Back to Basics a special and bringing us a heap of relief in knowing what to call on if we do get into trouble with some back pain or many other ailments. Still to come in Men's Mental Health Week, the Guru himself, Gus Wallen, joins us up next right here on the House of Wellness. How about some delicious, rich, chocolatey brownies that are packed with nutrients? Take a good look at my nutritious and delicious cacao beet brownies. Here's how to make them. Beat three eggs and half a cup of coconut sugar until light and fluffy. Sift flour and baking powder into the mix along with BioGlan organic cacao powder, which is full of magnesium, iron, antioxidants and polyphenols for energy and stress support. In go the pureed beets, chopped chocolate, hazelnut or almond meal and melted coconut oil. And then the lot gets poured into a tin or baking tray for 15 to 20 minutes. Allow to cool or eat these brownies while they're warm and gooey. And even if your kids don't eat their veggies, they can still have this dessert. Yeah, welcome back. It's Men's Health Week and sadly with that comes some pretty grim stats when it comes to the area of men's mental health, Heinze. Mate, the statistics say it all. Over 2,000 men take their lives every year and that's an average of six men every day. 
Yeah, it's a staggering statistic, Hines, you, but even with all the publicity and talk, there's still a stigma when it comes to tackling men's mental health. It's thanks to programs like Gotcha for Life that shines a very bright spotlight on this highly sensitive issue. Yeah, obviously off the field, yeah, you like being a good person, I guess, like trying to help people out, but when you're out there, it's all, you know, real competitive, I guess. You train really hard and you work really hard and you really want to have a win, so once you get out there, it's um, just rip right into it. Jake Trebovic has always been a formidable football player, but at heart, he's still the kid from the Mona Vale Footy Club who would apologise to his opponents after tackling them. Oh, I think just growing up, had a great family, obviously great parents, got um, brothers, we're all very close, so we always talk to each other and that sort of thing, so, yeah, I, I guess growing up, that's just the way I was raised, sort of thing, yeah. You know, everyone's got to be tough sort of thing when they're out there playing, but when, once you get off the field, try and be a good person, yeah. Turn, like be turned a bit. That's and it's that confidence to show his gentle side, despite the physical and mental toughness that comes with the game, that makes Jake the perfect candidate for Gus Wallen's men's mental health mission. Being an ambassador for Gotcha for Life is really important to me. Obviously, seeing the great work they do in the community is awesome. It's something I really wanted to be a part of. And, you know, anything that Gus Wallen does, I think, is awesome and great to be a part of. I'm obviously helping men out with their mental health and encourage them to speak up. So I want to try to get rid of, you know, the tough facade that, you know, you can speak to people and, and that's all right. Leave the head and then we'll try with both of them with wrist and head. The thing for me with Jake is that he plays one of the toughest games in the world in the middle of defence and in the middle of attack. So he's one of the real tough guys, plays for New South Wales and Australia, but he has that emotional muscle that I'm trying to get into so many other young boys in Australia to realise that it's OK not to be OK and it's OK to have emotions and it's OK not to have everything sorted out. And I think Jake's a wonderful example of someone who is tough and resilient, but also has that emotional stuff to talk about, and I think boys can learn a lot from him. Uh, what, and what was your thought process, like me, sort of? Yeah, exactly. Obviously, a lot of men go through different things at certain times of their life, and it's, you know, encouraging them that they can speak, and um, there's always someone there to help them. If you feel like that, then Jake, you can come in like that. I think rugby league can play a real part in being such a tough game, also explaining to people that it's OK, that you haven't got all the answers, and even though you might be tough for that 80 minutes on the field, outside of that, that's your true life, that's your family, that's your friends, that's your community. So if you have someone like Jake standing up at a school and saying, boys, train hard, work hard, be resilient, but there's a part of your life where you may need someone's support. Do not take the demons or the darkness that's going on in your head or any uncertainty. Don't bumble around with that information by yourself. Ask someone, speak to someone, get your gotcha for life friend that can help you through it. And I think he's a perfect example of the type of ambassador you need for that. A staggering one in five men suffer from some kind of mental illness. And with figures like that, there are few people who haven't been touched by its impact. A guy I played footy with when I was young, he uh, unfortunately he committed suicide a few years ago and then last year my um, yeah, uh, one of my younger brother, his good mate at uh, school, committed suicide. So that was, that was really sad times and just makes you know things like this really important that you know, we raise awareness and um, make people you know, feel better about speaking up. Joining us now, the man who started Gotcha for Life, Gus Wallen. Gus, great to see a young leader like Jake joining you in the campaign, uh, Gotcha for Life. Congratulations again, mate. Thanks a lot, and thanks for having me, guys. It's lovely to be on. Yeah, Jake, as far as I'm concerned, is just one of those really sort of manly men that a lot of blokes can look up to. But he also has that side of him that allows him to be vulnerable and open and honest and, and let people know that he hasn't got all the answers to everything. So that is the perfect combination of what we're trying to get. We're trying to get blokes still to be manly, still to be resilient, but also give themselves a break and understand that life is tough. And it's no problem in the world mm. for you to be able to put your hand up and say, I'm not coping. Can someone help me, please? Gus, we are having this conversation more and more and thank you for allowing us to do that. You give us a conduit for that and that's really wonderful, the thing that the work that you're doing. Thank you. But we speak and we you know we're we're changing beliefs and behaviours, yet still suicide is still the leading leading cause of death in young men. Yeah. And we would assume that that's the generation that are opening up more. Mm. So are we, are we? Is that a myth that they are, or is no. that something that we're not doing right? I think the awareness is definitely there, Joe. No doubt about it. But like most things, we can talk about it till the cows come home. Mm. It's action that has to start happening. So people now would understand that it's okay to chat, but we don't quite know how to mm. start that conversation. And if you do start it, and someone you're talking to doesn't get it, then you can be knocked 
for six. You can be knocked back really? years back to go, I'm never going to go and do that again. So it's treating the whole community of not coming out but also listening to it as well. Well, anyone who thinks taking their life is the only option is absolutely devastating. Yeah. But what do you think the main reasons are that they're getting to that point? Oh, there's so many different things. And for, for young people, I've got three teenagers. I've got a 19-year-old boy. He always thought that if you don't have the answers, then his life's going to be rubbish. The day that I actually turned around and say to him, because I made it up for a lot of the time, you know, if you've got little kids, you go, yeah, we'll just make that up mm. and they don't know any difference, so we'll get through it. Mm. The day where he was 15 and I actually was honest enough and vulnerable enough to say, Jack, I actually don't know the answer to that. Let's work it out together. Mm. That just gave wow. him this huge relief to go... I thought it was once you got to a certain age, blokes just knew everything. Mm. Oh. And I go, no, mate, we're making it up most of the time. We've got to do it. Yeah. Yeah, wow. so do you think that, that then our boys are being raised differently now than, say, a generation ago? Rach, I certainly hope so, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think there's a lot of blokes out there my age, sort of 50 to 60, 65, where the old ways of doing things are just so entrenched mm. that you don't actually... We haven't got through to those guys yet, so that's mm. why it's so important. We put on a, on a, on a couple of nights uh, last month, 250-odd blokes turned up. No tickets sold. Turn up if you want to. It was a miserable night and we had the place full. Blokes were standing. 70 blokes were standing because there was no seats. They're desperate for the information, mm. but if you don't have one of those nights on in your community or in your local area, where are you going to get the information from? You're just simply not going to get it. Hey, Gus, it's been a great passion of yours. Got you for a lot. Tell us a bit about it. It's about having a, a friend for life, uh, what does it mean? Yeah, friend is the right word, da. So most blokes in Australia have a whole heap of mates or at least blokes that they play sport with or they knock around with. Some of those relationships may not be that strong, but at least you've got a bit of a group, a bit of a crew. What I'm saying, what I'd love people to do is just to take one of those guys or find one person in your life where you can have a warts and all conversation with. Have a conversation where nothing is barred. Mm. You can be open, you can be honest, you can be vulnerable. If you just have one person you can talk to, that is better than what most blokes are bumbling around with at the moment. Mm. Most of us got a whole heap of mates but no real friends. Mm. And you need to learn to be a really good friend so you can help your mates come through. And then hopefully line. that spreads. Yeah. You talk That's about it. utilising our emotional muscle. Yeah. So is this mental health something that can be learned or is it something that we should be working on each and every day that will therefore grow? and I, stronger. Yeah, I think it's both of those things. And emotional muscle is the best word because most blokes know or understand you're going to a gym, you go and do your session, eventually your arms will look like you guys or <laughs> <laughs> you girls. <laughs> or I feel like I'm the only one that hasn't been to the gym in the last 10 years. But the, the simple point is, if you work on stuff in the gym, that's sort of easy for blokes to get and understand. Yeah. And you do that, you'll end up with that result. With the mind stuff, with the emotional muscle, it's so much more difficult. And you do feel like, oh, I don't quite know what to do here. There's yeah. no membership. There's no real program. So we are building those programs now. Wow. And those programs now, I, I believe, are really simple. Simple as going through your program at a gym. The thing is, it's not normal for us to do it, so we need to have the opportunity to build that in every community in Australia. It should be in every school in Australia. Mm -hmm. Mass geography, mental health. Mm. That should, just should be there. Beautifully yeah. said, uh, Gus. We've only just scratched the surface. Can you stick around? I'd love to. Always Thank good you. to have Gus uh, Wallen. Got you for life. More with Gus right after the break on the House of Wellness. Welcome back to the House of Wellness with Gus Wallen. Gus, when you were on the show last time, we played a clip from the Man Up, Speak Up campaign, which for the first time aired on commercial television. We had an incredible response, such a powerful uh, little segment that we did. So this time we've got another one to make its debut on national TV. Let's take a look. So on this farm, if we used to make hay in the old days, we would probably have four or six blacks here. And we'd have morning tea, we'd have lunch, so we'd be yakking and talking, we could talk crap. But if somebody was upset about something, somebody would pick up on it and, and they'd talk about it. Now, I could do the whole hay myself with machinery and stuff, so I'm on me Pat Malone. Right. So if something was annoying the hell out of me, I could be sitting in that tractor just stewing all day. People get horrified why the suicide rate is higher in rural men. Well, when the drought was on, we had to shoot sheep. If I had an old working dog, and there was quite a few, and that, and they couldn't do their jobs, whatever else, we'd put them down. Now, 
It's not a short straw between putting yourself down when you think you ain't worth a cracker. Yeah, what a powerful bit of imagery that is, Gus, and a bit of an indication of what's happening in the rural communities around Australia. How many guys like that have you met along your journey? Oh, I've been so fortunate. I mean, China, John Harper there, one of the absolute classics blokes who, you know, he's going through so much stuff himself, and because he's got no funding and no money, he will actually take his swag in the back of his car and he'll sleep on the side of the road because he needs to get to a farmer that has reached out to him oh, wow. and he doesn't even know who the bloke is. So when we started Gotcha for Life, it's like, well, mate, I'm going to give you a card mm. so you can buy petrol and go to a hotel and stay the night. You're 70 years old and you are saving blokes' lives every day. There's blokes like that in the community everywhere. The thing is, how can we get to all the communities with mm. blokes like Harps? And how can Harps then teach a whole lot of other blokes to go into communities too? Because the, the suicide rate is twice as bad in rural than, than in the city. What about the younger guys, though, in particular? Is it a lack of purpose or perhaps boredom? What is it for those guys? There's a whole lot of things. Um, bullying doesn't stop at the schoolyard anymore with social media. I mean, I was called chubby all my life and, and words harsher than that. But at 3 o'clock... Deep breath, got on the bus, got out of there, I was in my street, I was back with blokes that I knock around with playing different sports, my mum, my dad, my brothers and stuff. Now, I've got three teenage kids, that phone does not start mm. beeping. They've got five or six different apps on the go and if they don't, if they don't answer that question, then they're not in that group anymore, so that becomes a problem the next day at school. Alcohol drugs, so much easier to get now, so much cheaper to get. Yeah. So kids are looking for a way to get out of what they think is a boring life. And unfortunately, we're not doing a good job as Aussies to try to fix that. And we're getting this problem now where the number one way to lose your life is 15 to 44 year old is to take your own life. How can that happen in this country? Yeah, yeah it's just absolutely devastating. Oh, it's heartbreaking. And there are so many people like yourself and Harps who are doing great things. And another fantastic program that I've learned about is Head Above Water. Tell yeah. us about that. Well, this was wonderful. So we have nights where we have nights for the blokes. So they can turn up at a surf lifesaving club in New South Wales. We'll put the night on for free. We come in the community and blokes just turn up. Now, that's incredible. We had 256 blokes turn up on this night. Now, uh, Wardy, who's the guy that runs um, Head Above Water, he turned up, had his own dramas, his own demons. We chatted that night. He was at the end of the room. And he said, you know what? I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight. And I go, this is how you can fight. We went through a few things. He went to a program for three weeks, came out. His wife adores him. His kids adore him. And he goes, I'm a swimmer. I haven't swum for a year. Imagine, Rach, all the stuff that makes you feel good and happy. Mm. All of a sudden, you just don't do it because you forget mm. what makes you happy mm. because you are battling every day just to get through it. You need to be able to open up and talk about that. Absolutely. But he didn't know. He was just like, I have to do what everyone tells me to do. And he was this robot. All of a sudden, he went, I'm going swimming again. Started swimming. All the stuff that happens in the body made him feel mm. alive. And he went, I'm going to do a 24-hour swim. I'm going to invite everyone along. Every mate I know is going to sponsor a lane. So here we go. So it's we so swam for 24 hours. The greatest thing about that night, me and my mates, we did the 3.30 till 4am. No one wanted to do that shit. <laughs> so I put my eyes and I can't complain. I've got to get in there. We turned up. There was music going. There was a barbecue. Everyone was pumped. The light was on. You know how when workmen... Um, you know, working in the middle of the night, they put those, those huge crazy bodies. Flood lights. It looks, it's like yes. it's like daylight. Yeah. So we just jumped in and we had the best fun. And some of us were walking, some of us mucking around. The weather was horrendous. We jumped in one lane, we got put into another lane. <laughs> it was the worst night. We had the best fun. <laughs> and I got off, and we're all telling ourselves, down we're wearing Gotcha for Life speedos. And we're, which, <laughs> believe me, Rach, you don't want to see. <laughs> I'm sure it was perfect. So, so, there, so there we were, and I said, imagine, boys, if we turned the light off. Imagine everyone left and just you were here in this pool. Think about that for a moment. That is what blokes are going through mm. with mental illness. Mm. As soon as you put some light onto it, as soon as you add some other people to it, all of a sudden a bit of music, a barbecue and a few like-minded people, it was fun. Mm. And that's what we have to tell young boys and also men in this country. Put a light on the fact that you're feeling average most people will come and rally for you, whether it's professional, whether it's your mates or your family. That was a perfect sort of synergy, if you like, of what it's all about. You spoke yeah. earlier, Gus, about kids and how difficult it is with this overload of exposure to, you know, communication, mm. social yeah. media. 
as a mum, I'm raising a two-year-old boy. What mm. advice would you give to mums raising those young kids and how to guide them through the ability to be able to express themselves freely and open up about their problems? Yeah, you've got a few years to go, so two is <laughs> such an awesome age. They will know at some stage that you're a celebrity, you're well-known. If mum is setting the example, no, I'm not putting this on Insta, no, I'm not... This is time for my mm. husband, you and the kids. Mm. That is the absolute key. It's got to come from mum and dad. We've got a basket now at home, three teenagers... Phones go in the basket as soon as you get home. How long do you reckon that took to, for that oh, rule to weeks. come into place? <laughs> and the, I, am, I, I am a lover, not a fighter. I'm going, oh, given the bloody phones and my wife's English. She's an English person who's an English teacher. She's ruthless. Right? Those phones go in that basket no matter what. But you've got to stick to it. Because I need to borrow easiest... your wife in my yeah. house, Gus, I promise I'm you. I'm sure she'd like to borrow you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> That's another segment for another time, Gus, on the House of Wellness. I tell you what, as always, we could dedicate the whole show and a whole month to you. your messages. They're fantastic. So if you are experiencing mental health uh, challenges, please go to the Mental Health Access Line's 24-7 service. Beyond Blue is a fantastic uh, service as well. Lifeline Australia, always there to help. Or as Gus says, reach out to a friend, a sporting or a community group or family member for support. It's uh, incredible uh, access that we need to get. Let's get this stat of six men a day down to zero, Gus. It's a campaign that you need great credit for. Thank you very much. And thanks for shows like this for allowing me to have a chat. It means a lot. Thanks. Oh, we love it, thanks, Gus. Gus. Thanks for joining us. More to come on the House of Wellness right after this. Picks. Always wear the same pair of jocks. Just black, black jocks. Yes. I'm sure. <laughs> Have to be back in black, ACDC. It always gets me pumped. I'm not singing. I'm not singing. I'm sorry, I'm not today. <laughs> <laughs> Ate too much in the off season, and one one bloke called me pig, and it stuck. So yeah, that was steely, but everyone likes pig. I would say lazy, because I never return their calls. Well, I, re I do, but it just takes a couple of days. <laughs> Is that bad? Hands for feet, because monkeys do and can climb and stuff. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Is that a good answer? <laughs> He's a ripper, young Jack Steele from the St Kilda Football Club, having a great season, Joe. Yes. So, did you have any pre-game rituals to us? Like, a special pair of Well, I, I had the cliched <laughs> same pair of jocks and socks, did seriously, you? and then I lost them oh, and no. I was devastated. I thought, I've got to drop that straight away because yeah. that's just not Were you work. okay? You could still no, play without... No, I was without... devastated, <laughs> but uh, no superstitions after. Hey, talking about jocks, there's two at the health bar right now, oh. two very fine <laughs> strapping uh, young men. What's happening today, Gerald? How long Gerald? has it been since you've been called a jock, Gerald? Well, I'm wearing my black jocks today. Oh, well, hello. So, <laughs> if you really want to know. But thanks, Ars. And, and what it's doing is obviously now a good emphasis on prostate health and it's important if, from what we've learned so far that we need to be much more open about discussing the health issues around prostates. Mate you are so right talking about your prostate can be a little uncomfortable and a lot of guys don't even know where it is and they think that it actually is just to do with older guys mm -hmm. but should I be uh, strapping on a bit of a rubber glove is that what this segment is about? You will be relieved Heinze to know that that's not done all that much these days. Okay. There's a very simple blood test that you go along and you can have but that's more for uh, a, a PSA test which is more an indicator of prostate cancer risk but what we need to understand the gland is there this is a, what is it? a what gland is that sits beneath the bladder yep. and it's there to excrete fluid to help semen flow. So that's its function. Okay. It's a fluid producing gland. The problem is that as we get older, it increases in size. That's the challenge. So what can cause it to become bigger? We all carry testosterone and that is converted to another hormone called di dihydrotestosterone. So that conversion into dihydrotestosterone causes prostate cells to replicate far faster than normal. We see that in issues like more frequent urination at night, uh, an inability to actually completely empty your bladder, 
to um, difficulty in starting and stopping. So these are issues that are, are lifestyle issues that a lot of blokes just say, oh, look, it's just that. But it does involve... The These prostate. symptoms don't sound quite right. And if anyone was experiencing them, what's mm -hmm. something that we could do to look after our prostate and manage it? The first thing we've got to do is look at our nutritional intake, so food choices. So fruits and vegetables, how often do we talk about those, Heinze? And uh, back off saturated fat, look at fish a little more often. But there has been, since the 1900s, a spectacular herb called saw palmito, which is here. And saw palmito is the fruit of a particular palm tree called a Serenoa repens yep. that the North American physicians uh, did call the old man's friend. Now, what that herb does is interfere in that conversion process that I just mentioned. So if you can slow down the conversion process, you therefore reduce the risk of the prostate getting larger. Are there any other natural remedies? Yes, there are. We've got nettle, which is here. Nettle is the classic urinary herb. Mm -hmm. And another one that's often combined is grapeseed because that's an overall protective herb. Now, we've got to remember that when you're about 20, the prostate gland is about the size of a walnut, so including the shell. Yep. By about 40, it's the size of an apricot. By about 60, it's the size of a lemon. And that therefore means it can put pressure on the tube, on the ureter, which drains urine out, to the body, out, out of the body. So that when that happens, then there can be those issues that we just went through. So those that just want to look after their prostate health or those that might be experiencing mm -hmm. those symptoms, these are herbs and things that they can incorporate into their everyday life? Yes, they can, very simply. And it's the sort of thing that's often brought up by, by the partner, by the spouse, that's ah. disturbed by the number of uh, visits to the toilet during the night. And, and they say, well, for heaven's sake, go and do something about it. This is a simple way. Now, enlarged prostate's got a name, it's called BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia. It's a fairly common thing because of this ageing process. But here is a herbal combination that intervenes in that protection process and the conversion process. Is there well. a particular age that people should ta start taking these supplements? Look, I think we should all be aware of our prostate, all we blokes are hindsy, but around 50 is where that hormone transition starts to occur. So it's about 50 that normally we need to be thinking, how am I travelling? Now, prostate cancer is the most common cancer for men. Yes. Is there a link between the two? No, there's not a direct link. They can sometimes occur together, but just because you have an enlarged prostate doesn't necessarily mean you are at increased risk of prostate cancer. Now, that test you were mentioning before, um, which is no longer done with the rubber gloves and the mm -hmm. perspiration on the upper lip... Damn! Um, <laughs> we, we have a very simple blood test now which measures PSA, and it's a very reassuring thing to go and have done, which is part of routine testing these days anyway. Well, mate, we should be looking after our health totally. and our prostate. Totally. You are so right with everything you say. Gerald, thank you so much. The A to Z of vitamins is brought to you by Go Healthy, New Zealand's number one premium supplement brand, now available in Australia. Welcome back. The mid-year school holidays are almost here and for many of us that's an opportunity to pack up the gear and head off for a break. What about you, Rach? You're a well-travelled individual. Where's your favourite holiday destination? Well, for holidays it usually means enjoyment. So with a two-and-a-half-year-old, we tend to not travel too far in the plane because <laughs> it can be an absolute mm. nightmare. It's either... We actually really love Fiji. It's pretty boring, but it's a beautiful place and it's close. Or we head up to Townsville to visit my fam, do some camping and some mm. water skiing. So nice. get yeah. into nature. Hello. What about you, Joe? Uh, I love a road trip somewhere in Australia. Mm. It's usually pretty cheap and you know the food's great and you can always find great beaches or watering holes. I did Tasmania in January this year, which was an absolute revelation. Beautiful. And then I did Northern Territory a couple of years ago. Best road trip ever. I'm going to do WA next, I think. I love that you keep it local, Joe. Thank but you. did you know that New Zealand, Indonesia and the States are Aussie's top overseas destinations, but with average flight times ranging from just a few hours to a back aching 25 or more, just getting where you're going can mess with your health. So here's the thing. People are more likely to cry on flights. And no, it's not about the movies. Flying is stressful. The whole process heightens your emotions and leaves you exhausted, which is why I have a strategy. Thank you. Excellent. You're, Cheers, buddy. Buddy. Thank you. You're 100 times more likely to catch a cold on a flight, with lots of studies demonstrating why germs and bacteria thrive on board a plane. Fresh air is a game changer. If you can sleep with open windows or doors, you will feel so much better. 
The most common illness to affect travellers is diarrhoea, caused by dodgy food or water, which is why I like to find local shops that have produce that I know agrees with me. I Google words like health, fresh, organic, whole foods, and then stock up. I always choose bottled water. A cold drink might be okay, but the ice in the glass could be made with contaminated water. Time is precious, so I take every precaution to make sure I don't miss out on the sights. A snack pack with food types designed for slow release energy means there's no wasted time out there searching for munchies. Lunchbox is packed and I always take my dehydrated bone broth. This is fantastic for looking after my gut health when I'm on the road. It's a great feeling to stretch your legs after a long haul flight. The change in air pressure and sitting for so long can cause puffiness, or what I like to call jet bloat. So get the limbs working, even if you're clocking up the Ks with lots of walking. So I always throw some things in like squats, lunges or step ups. From there, I think about my upper body. If I can, I do some type of pull exercise, maybe a pull up. Beyond that, there's some simple moves that I do on the spot that are fantastic to increase my heart rate, whether it's skipping, switching or star jumps. They're really, really good ways to do cardio anywhere, anytime with not much space. And then of course there's dehydration from the flight and moving in and out of aircon. So while you're drinking loads of water, turn up the hydration on the outside with a good quality moisturizer with a sunscreen. And at the end of a jam packed day, close the eyes and spend some time inside your head. It's the best way to conquer any jet lag and reboot the system, primed and ready for the next adventure. I tell you what, I'm feeling a bit guilty about eating the Pringles the first thing I do when I walk into a hotel room. That's a good routine, Hozzy. How about the uh, the bone broth uh, travel? Have you had any trouble through customs? Oh, mate, bone powdered bone broth is the least of my worries through customs. I'm all good. <laughs> That's to throw them off the scent. But it's like, it'd be okay for the flight getting on, but then you'd probably just have to d discard it when yeah, you get out on the other end. Yeah, it customs. Mm. Holmes, you don't travel with children, right? No. It's quite obvious. Yep. Because if you've got kids in your room, there is no exercise. None of that. No switches. <laughs> I, I disagree. <laughs> I, well, I don't... It's not possible. I haven't been able to do that. And I do cry on a plane because I've got my daughter with me. <laughs> and, I was, and she's beautiful, but I'm like, how do I get up to business class? <laughs> I've never been there before. <laughs> well, that's it for the week. Thanks for joining us. Go to our website, houseofwellness.com.au, for everything on today's show and more. Don't forget to tune in to our radio show every Sunday. And as always, thanks to our very good friends at Chemist Warehouse. See you next week. Yeah, Imagine us all travelling together. <laughs> <laughs> I want to travel with you. That's fun.